Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's my pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. And uh, I think we say the, today's topic uh, is that uh, uh, 300,000 uh, multicultural families in South Korea, and the, uh, how can we have uh, capacity to enhance the employability? I think it's a somewhat quite a uh, specific issue, but uh, we have many attendants here. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, let me say f uh, from the start point, and I will just uh, raise some uh, overall uh, points uh, with regard to this issue. And, uh, Yesterday, I've gone through with uh, all sessions, and uh, I learned that uh, everybody is quite interested in uh, the the point that so we are living in an industry of four four point zero, and the fourth uh, industrial revolution, and then, so I think it's a software is so important one, and the second one is a this creativity for uh, development. And the second one, venture, venture business. And the uh, fourth one is an open-ended uh, industrial structure. And finally, a flexible industrial conflict adjustment. I think it's these four uh, issues are all uh, quite relevant. And uh, uh, therefore, I think that the industry 4.0 and HRD as a business partner, and a long-term low growth is a normal, that's what today is, right? And uh, at the same time, IoT, cyber physical systems, CPS, and uh, uh, artificial intellectuals based industry 4.0. These are the key issues we have to uh, concern about and with at the same time. And uh, given this, and uh, as I told you that uh, HRD and employment for multicultural family, we have uh, 300,000 family members in South Korea today. And uh, also whole total numbers of uh, their family members uh, together, I think they say around uh, 1.6 million or so. So it's just very important target groups and uh, you know, how we can deal with this issue. And, uh, and fortunately, we have a very prominent uh, presenters today. And uh, originally, we were going to have two uh, presenters. But unfortunately, as some of you might know that uh, uh, one professor from uh, uh, the uh, Arkansas, and uh, she's got uh, lost her passport yet. Uh, Chicago International Airport. So she has, uh, but uh, this, uh, I'm sure that's, uh, I think that this is the first time for her. That's why some kind of uh, mental uh, disorder. Uh, but uh, originally you think that maybe she can just uh, ask uh, CIA agent members there, and then no problem to go to Korea because they are ready for everything. Is. But uh, she was shocked. So finally, she uh, returned home. But uh, I think that her mindset is still here. <laughs> so miserable things happen. Uh, well, on the other hand, we have one uh, presenter today, but nevertheless, and he's a wonderful and a phenomenon, uh, I mean, I mean he's a famous uh, scholar in uh, New Zealand. And uh, let me introduce uh, him first. If you look at uh, page 114, what, 141, and, uh, okay, and uh, uh, Dr. Stuart Middleton, and uh, he's director of external relations, Monaco Institute of Technology, MIT. So famous, isn't it? Uh, education, and she's got a PhD uh, from Massey University in New Zealand, 
And if we look at his, uh, his uh, educational background and uh, all uh, curriculum and this whole variety of uh, so diverse backgrounds, I am uh, really uh, surprised to notice that uh, after uh, his master degree and a lot of uh, diverse areas, all related with uh, second language teaching and uh, transformational uh, change in education, so on and so forth. So I really, really appreciate uh, uh, and uh, look forward to his uh, excellent uh, presentation from now on, which will take place in uh, 20 minutes. And then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Stewart. Uh, I've just greeted you in uh, not English, but in the language of our indigenous people in New Zealand, the Māori. In the course of my daily work, which is in a very large institution in Auckland, New Zealand, I would also say talo falava, uh, nisa bulavanaka, uh, whakalo falahi atu. Uh, I would say uh, nisa, I would say uh, namaste, ni men hao, a whole range of different greetings uh, which are habitually used in a, the multilingual environment of a diverse institution. And because I am uh, talking about diversity and I am here today, I also say Anyong Hasiyo. <laughs> this presentation is about diversity and it's about the pre pre preparation of a di diverse group of people to enter a diverse workforce but it's also about a tension that lies in this basic argument. And that tension is between the requirement that you produce sameness, but at the same time respect difference. And I'll, uh, I'll expand on that. Diversity is an international phenomenon now. It's, it's rare that there is a developed country which is not seeing significant migration for the reasons that I have uh, outlined up, up there. And, and at the moment, we're going through a phase in global uh, phenomenon of all countries trying to meet their skill shortage uh, by getting out there and competing for a group of skilled workers from other countries. And that's happening very rapidly indeed. Um, and New Zealand is following in the same pattern as I guess all the other developed countries uh, of the world are. And uh, at the same time, we're under increasing pressure to train our own people up so that they can take the jobs, but we just don't seem to be able to make that match very well. We always seem to be trying to produce skilled workers, but the moment has slightly passed by the time we, we, we achieve it. Um, New Zealand uh, is, a, is a relatively simple country. There was an indigenous Maori population. Along came the British and colonized the country and, uh, uh, and settled. And for 100 years, Maori were rather suppressed and they were rather marginalized. Um, but uh, then there, there came quite a significant shift from about the 1960s on when there was significant migration from the Pacific Islands uh, uh, a, and a new immigrant group from Asia predominantly following the, uh, the, reuni the um, changes in Hong Kong governance. Uh, and, uh, and then most recently in the 1990s, we got international student migration happening significantly. And that's a, a very large factor in bringing a lot of young people who are not seeking simply to come and study, but are seeking to come and stay. And so study is the pathway through to a, a residency permit and then on through to employment. And now we join the rest of the world with the, uh, this, our skill shortages and trying to replace it. So there are big uh, patterns of change happening. And there's a process involved with this. It's not just about education and training. The population becomes more diverse. Edu it, the general education system within a country gets under pressure. 
the education and training uh, for, for employment gets under pressure, um, and the vocational uh, training is preparing diverse people, not just for, for a simple uh, range of things, but in fact all those sectors that are listed at the bottom of the, the, uh, the page there. And so it's not just as if we can complain that, say, education and training is under, is under, under pressure. Every sector in the economy is under pressure uh, for different reasons. Now, I showed you a modern uh, building uh, early in the uh, uh, presentation. Now you're seeing an old building. Um, that's my office. Well, one room in there is one of my office. Um, and uh, uh, we are situated in Auckland City. We're a big institution. Uh, we've got uh, three major campuses and nine smaller campuses, seven faculties, and there they are there. It's what you would expect from a vocational education and training institution. And don't forget to read the yellow bit at the bottom because we're quite pleased about that. We are the top rated polytechnic in New Zealand. The little theme that's going to run through this is that you should be able to walk into an institution that's dealing with a diverse range of students and you should be able to see that, that diversity. You shouldn't have to look for it. It should be there. And I'm just using some simple examples here. We respect our Māori community uh, in New Zealand by having these significant cultural artefacts within the institution. So this is, this is what we call the marae. This is the spiritual centre, the core of the institution, and that matters a lot to our communities and to our Māori people. And, uh, you know, it looks like a traditional meeting house, but that actually functions as a very central part of a, of a thing. It's an investment that institutions have to make so that when Maori students walk in to an institution, they say, I feel at home here. This is where I, this is where I can relate to. Now, it's not just about buildings and that. It's also about the way we behave. Now, what are those two people doing? Trying to get a piece of grit out of their eye or something like that? No, they're saying hello. And that is the, um, the ha hariru, uh, which at the end of a formal greeting, Māori will press noses, uh, and uh, they will exchange the breath of life uh, between two people. Um, and so, you know, you think about it, all the different ways that, that diversity demands we say hello, we say goodbye. Uh, you, you have a very gracious bow that you give. We have a thing. If, it, if I'm greeting a Tongan person, I will hug them. It doesn't matter if they're man or woman, and I will probably kiss them. Uh, and, uh, you know, those are the different ways in which, which it's a thing. Now, think, think about the impact, if that is not done, on people who come into our communities and see only somebody else's way of behaving. They need to see their own way of behaving if they are to feel uh, markedly at home. We've got a very significant Pacific community. So we have a very uh, um, significant Pacific community center. This is for our Pacific communities to come, come in and use. And that's some of the decorations are in the, the left there. And you can see that the art forms of the Pacific, of the different Pacific nations, are on the wall. And they're saying to people, this is your place. If someone can't feel at home, then they're not going to be very able to settle down and, uh, and work hard to, to um, say, I am being respected here. I will respect the way I'm being taught as, as well. So that if you walk into any uh, teaching uh, space at, uh, at MIT, you'll see different groups uh, w working together. Each one of those four students, that's a tutor on the right-hand side, each one of those four students comes from a different cultural background. Right? Now, the, the challenge uh, to teaching a group like that is understanding what those backgrounds are and being able to then bring together a group that is different in the quest for sameness. And that sameness is the set of technical skills, the set of knowledge, uh, the set of uh, um, uh, abilities and understandings, the, uh, the uh, requirements of, of uh, regulatory standards within different industries. Those are the samenesses because you need to bring them all through to a level where you can accredit them to say these people are well prepared, well trained and ready to go. 
That does not mean that they've taken off their blue coats and all become the same. It means that they, they are still a Samoan electrician, they are Tongan plumber, they are a Maori painter. They have retained their identity as people, but they develop a shared set of competencies and skills. So, so overall, that's a really big challenge. Um, I used to, when I was working in London at one stage, um, there was a lot of talk about multiculturalism and those sorts of things, so you can guess when that was. Um, and um, uh, they used, it was a, my friend of mine used to always say, it used to use the illustration of a little girl from India who was in the school system, and he said, and every day when the school bell went, Sharma walked home to India. The gap between her, her school life and her home life was very, very significant. And sometimes an institution has to take on uh, as a capacity to, to respond. Uh, you spot me in the middle there? Ah, oh, yes, good. So uh, I'm the smallest one. Um, and, uh, but in that group, we are actually, that is a Tongan graduation ceremony, and this is the official party. And, uh, you know, you say, but this is, this is silly stuff. They're all dressing up. Why aren't they? No, they're not. They're putting on their good clothes. They're putting on the clothes that they would wear when they go to church on Sunday. They're dressing up because it's an important occasion because on that particular occasion, 400 of their young people all qualified with a certificate in technical skills. So, you know, that, this becomes a habitual way of working. And I'm asking you to be thinking as we go through this, what happens in your institutions that will reflect diversity? What could you make happen? Because I'm not going to say that you all now have to dress like Tongans. I'm not going to say you have to rub noses like Māori, because that, you have to be what would be the genuine way of behaving to say to people, there's, in our world, there's a place for you. And I think that's a, a really important thing. I'm amazed when I go into even some institutions in New Zealand, and you would never guess that we have people speaking many languages. We try and, uh, uh, and have bilingual signage and uh, uh, those sorts of things. I'm the director of external relations of the Kaitiaki Mātou and Malta Mahi uh, which is my Māori title uh, for my job. It, 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 it makes a statement, doesn't it, that, uh, that here it matters. So. In education and training, I'm saying, I'm arguing that ethnic identity must be preserved and you've got to manage that difficult balance between, on the left-hand side, getting people ready, qualified, knowledgeable for work, and on the other side, continuing to nourish the person, to grow the person, because that's at the heart of learning. If you stop people's development, you will stop their learning. And so you need to work. This applies a little more to younger people, younger students, than to older ones, which I'll mention in a few minutes. That's just a little bit of a, a snapshot there. We're in the heart of what people would think of as a, as a European country, and yet in our institution, Europeans are fewer than 20%. So... You know, if we don't get good at dealing with a diverse group of people, we haven't got a job, we haven't got work, we haven't got a institution that we can we can feel proud of. So that's a challenge. And it's you know you've got to split Pacific Island up into seven different islands too, um, and there's some significant differences there that you ignore at your peril. And trying to get diversity into the teaching staff is a really big challenge. And you can see that our statistics are heavily weighted in a different way between the teaching staff and the students. So how are we going to manage that? Diversity does not mean hom uh, that means that people aren't homogenous. No, that's not all, not all the same. And people will bring quite a few different characteristics in. I'm, I'm going to do a little bilateral kind of... Um, um, uh, by normal sort of uh, uh, distinction that some will come in uh, into a, a new community and they'll be experienced while others will be novices. Some will be older, some will be younger. 
Some uh, will have, continue to have family and community and homeland obligations. So in a way, they only bring most of their life with them. Some of their life is still somewhere else, where grandparents live, where brothers live, and where sisters live, and where families they've been dislocated from and some everything. And then there's a lot of status. A lot of people come into our communities and work in our workforce who have already had quite a lot of status where they've come from, and yet we expect them to start at the bottom. We are not very good at recognizing the status that people have had in their previous lives. Uh, that affects older people uh, quite a lot. When I was doing my PhD, it's a while ago now, I had a very intelligent conversation about quite a tricky piece uh, uh, issue to do with research. And, and this person who had recently come to New Zealand gave me a really concise uh, um, uh, analysis of how I could solve an issue I had. And he did this while he drove the taxi that took me from the airport to my home. He was working as a taxi driver, and yet he had had great status as an educational researcher in his previous country. So we've got to consider two groups, because they are different. The younger novice coming in needs to be trained, and they want to get into the workforce. Uh, the older one coming in needs also to get into the workforce. Now, sometimes we are concentrating so much on the group A that we don't pay enough attention to group B. But they come in and they say, oh, you're a qualified tradesman uh, in our country. That's probably why you've been allowed to come in and settle here. And they're expected to be ready, arrive on Sunday, ready for work on Monday. And yet think of the changes they need to go through to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to be assimilated into a new work environment. Right. Um, the, the, the young ones, the young ones have, have really, you, you, you've got to keep the momentum going with the young. You've got to keep their training going. They need to be, uh, they need to, to have that uh, attention paid to their personal growth and development if we're serious about their growth and development in specialist area, areas. And therefore, programs have got to respect languages that are not perhaps widely understood. They are uh, got to allow potential to be recognized. So it's a very complex business. And, you know, I'm, I'm the, your people, uh, a lot of you greatly engaged with education, you know what I'm talking about. And slowly, slowly that student reaches the point where, where they show the success that all the others do. On the other hand, the older migrant com coming into the workforce has needs as well. They might not have the competence in a new language that they need. They, they might need to adjust to doing things differently, and yet they've not been shown uh, in any systematic way how that needs to be done. They really can be very easily insulted and put down if there is not respect for their experience. And yet there's an, there is a tendency in a lot of industries for them just to be treated as a newcomer. And uh, some of them have had high-level positions, they've had leadership positions, they've had positions of great expertise, and now they need uh, to have that recognized. But where we also miss out, they are the elder members of a community and could be enormously helpful for us in bringing in the younger members of the same community. If we're going to bring in, let me use uh, uh, the example of, say, Samoan. Where if we're going to bring young Samoans into building and construction, then where would that leadership best come from? Answer, highly competent, skilled, knowledgeable, Samoan, experienced workers. Uh, and yet we want to keep it to ourselves, don't we? Don't we? You know, oh no, we can't hand that across, that's too important. Uh, so we need to be just become a, a lot more mindful of our own limitations and how they can be compensated for by the skills that, uh, that others have. And I'm just going to mention two, two little programs we have now. We've got a big trades training program in Auckland uh, for training Maori and Pacific young people into the trades. It involves polytechnics, it involves community organizations and industry training organizations. 
That's because Polytechnics thought they could do it on their own. They don't need any help. We're the highly skilled uh, educational institution. Well, the truth of the matter is that we could only do half the job. That if we want to bring these young people through, then we need a very complex uh, way of working. And so we use uh, community organisations, by that I mean, we will use uh, Samoan churches, we'll use Tongan pastors, we'll use uh, uh, Maori Marae and, uh, and different community organisations to come in and provide uh, a certain kind of support. We'll do the education entry. And the industry training organisations, typically, we've kept them at a, something of a distance. They come into the programme and they chaperone, if you like, the, the young person coming through into employment and they look after them uh, until they're well settled in employment and, uh, and, and working there. So you need to see the model rather than being a simple one. It's like a, a beautiful design of a plaited uh, uh, strands and everyone is there all the time as you move from recruitment through into a career and beyond. Everyone is in there providing their input. And that's quite an important uh, point. Uh, working in teams with others uh, enriches uh, our work. I'm not going to spend time on this too much except to say we also bring a lot of very young people into a tertiary institution because that's a great experience for them. And in New Zealand we have credit-based school qualifications as well as tertiary qualifications so we can, del we can give them credit for doing a one-day-a-week program or a two-day-a-week program that they can take back and get credited against their high school diploma. And so that, that's really working uh, very well indeed. Um, and uh, Now, we've mostly been talking about the people that are coming into our workforce. What about the people that have been there for quite a long time? What about the middle managers and the upper managers? Now, they can constitute a very difficult group indeed when dealing with a diverse workforce. Uh, people will come in and we just automatically assume that those middle managers and the uh, higher level managers can do the job. They can, they can do that. They're highly very good at their job. But it's, it's, it's as new to them as it is to, to others. So you do need to pay attention to reskilling and upskilling middle management if you're going to have a diverse uh, uh, workforce um, and that, that responds. Um, place for cultural difference. Should you have ethnic-based gangs working, I don't mean gangs in the criminal sense, uh, uh, it, it, working gangs, you know, teams. Uh, should teams be based around ethnicity in a, in a, in a big industrial complex? Uh, I don't know. Um, if people are going to say, oh, it's better if we all integrate, it's better if we all mix up. Well, sometimes it might be better if there are high levels of comfort uh, uh, for each person. And finally, you know, if the world's going to be grey or beige or the same colour, it's not going to be very exciting. And I think diversity is bringing it to our communities and into our lives and into our work uh, some very, very big excitements as well as challenges. And I think of, you know, a picture that only has one colour on it isn't actually very exciting, is it? Nor is music that doesn't have many sounds or notes. And a beautiful, vibrant economy, I think, in the, in the, uh, the 21st century is made up of lots of different ethnicities, bringing their different cultures, speaking their different languages, and enriching new communities. So, I will finish by greeting you as I would if I were at home. Kia ora katoa, mālo o pito, whāwhatai, meitaki. Those are just some of the thank yous that we do. And I thank you for this opportunity to be here today and to speak with you. quite interesting.
and uh, significant and quite suggestive and uh, uh, just uh, feeling like uh, we were Manukai in New Zealand. Uh, the pictures are uh, given us as quite, uh, you say, beautiful and uh, seems like a combination of uh, your culture and uh, identity and uh, skill enhancement go all together. Wonderful. And, uh, so I am sure that all of us uh, from the floor will have a lot of questions later on and beforehand, and uh, we'll have uh, two, uh, another professional uh, designated discussants. Uh, let me uh, invite first uh, Dr. Yinam Chul, and he's a director in the Center for Global Cooperation in Kribet, and uh, he's got PhD from the University of uh, Oklahoma, and he's major in, in, in economics. And uh, uh, he's also a significant uh, organizer member uh, for this forum. We all appreciate it. And uh, please welcome Dr. Inam Chul. E 대부분이 한국 분이라 제가 영어로 준비를 했는데 한국말로 좀 하겠습니다. 사실 오늘 그 미국의 교수님이 제가 그이 분야의 유명한 교수님을 초대했는데 아까 좌장께서 말씀하신 대로 그런 불행한 일이 있었습니다. 그래서 이 이분이 한국 경제 신문사와 인터뷰 기사가 그한 2주 전에 나가 있어요. 그래서 혹시 필요하면 그분이 발표할 내용이 그 기사로 이렇게 돼 있습니다. 그래서 참고하시고요. 저는 이 토론자지만 그 한국의 그 다문화 부분 이 부분에 대해서 그 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 이 표는 우리 이 국적별로 연도별로 우리 한국의 그 국제 결혼을 해서 그 이민 온 사람들의 그 통계 수치를 나타낸 것입니다. 이제 보시는 바와 같이 매년 이 국제 결혼에 의해서 한국의 이민이 되는 분들이 이렇게 매년 증가하고 있습니다. 이렇게 증가하는 중에 제일 많은 부분이 중국하고 우리가 쉽게 얘기하는 조선족 이 부분이 좀 많고 아, 그 다음으로 베트남 의외로 그 일본에서 이민 온 분이 많습니다. 이 일본에서 한국의 이민원 분들이 많은 이유는 제가 여기서 이 종교적인 이런 얘기는 하지 않, 않겠습니다. 구체적인 건 여기서 얘기를 하지 않는데 일본에서 한국으로 이민 오는 사람들이 상당히 많습니다. 이, 이 내용은 제가 종교적인 문제이기 때문에 말씀을 하지 않겠습니다. 그 다음에 이 그림은 이제 그 다문화 가족의 그 상태를 이제 왼쪽에 그림해 보시면. 2006년부터 2015년까지 그 18살 아래 학생들에 대한 그 통계 수치를 나타낸 것입니다. 그래서 보면 매년 이렇게 숫자가 증가하고 있죠. 그래서 이 순간에도 늘어나고 있고 저는 내년에도 더 많이 늘어날 걸로 이렇게 생각이 됩니다. 이렇게 다문화 가족의 학생 숫자가 이 특히 여러분들이 어, 안산시나 이런 데 가보시면 정말로 이게 한국인지 그 해, 외국인지 잘 구분이 잘안갈 것입니다. 근데 두 번째 토론하신 우리 저 박사님께서 그 옛날 법무부 과장도 하시고 이런 부분에 대해서 잘 아십니다. 그래서 이 내용은 저보다도 더 나중에 좀 말씀드릴 걸로 생각이 들고 그 하단에 보면 이제 이 멀티컬처럴 그 자제들 그래서 이제 연령별로 보면 이제 좀 특이한 다른 면이 있습니다. 아홉 살부터 24세까지의 경우에 보면 이 멀티컬처럴 칠드런 후 본앤 앤 레진 코리아 한국에서 태어나서 자란 사람이 73.1%이고 에 그렇지 않은 이미그레 이미그레이티 투 코리아 한 사람이 26.9. 에 그러나 이제 그 18살에서 24세까지 여긴 좀 다른 면을 보이고 있습니다. 이 통계에서 보면 그래서 금방 이렇게 이해를 하실 걸로 생각이 듭니다. 
이 조금 전에 말씀드린 부분과 좀이 숫자가 이제 바뀐 부분을 우리가 좀 염두에 둬야 될 걸로 생각이 듭니다. 이 얘기는 갈수록 다문화 가정의 자제들이 나이를 먹어가면서 이제 내년, 내후년, 앞으로 10년 이런 연령이 높아갈수록 이제 많아진다 이렇게 얘기를 할수 있겠습니다. 그래서 오른쪽 그림에 보시면 이 학생들이 이제 그 다문화 가정 학생들이 학교에서 그 서스펜션 되는 경우를 얘기하는데 한국말로 정확히 잘 모르니까 혹시 영어 사전 한번 찾아보시고 서스펜션에 대해서는 하시면 되겠습니다. 이 서스펜션 되는 사람들 보면 제일 큰 부분이 이 교사와 학생 간의 관계, 친구 관계가 이렇게 문제가 큰것 같습니다. 그래서 이런 부분이 정책적으로나 이런 부분에 많은 배려가 고려가 있어야 될것 같고 특이한 부분은 이제 그 중간쯤 보면 패밀리 익스페디스 이렇게 돼 있죠. 그 하단 이제 회색으로 된 부분 이 부분에서는 이제 그 조금 전에 말씀드린 학생과 교사의 이 역할과 다르게 이 29.2%가 나타나는 게 멀티컬처럴 칠드런 후 이미그레이티 투 코리아 이 부분은 가장 높은 이 가족의 기대감 우리 여기 젊은 분도 많이 있지만 우리 부모님들이 자식에 대한 기대가 많, 너무 많습니다. 기대가 크면 실망이 크다듯이 뭐 기, 기대가 너무 크기 때문에 이런 그 다문화 가정에 대한 이런 그이 문제도 있는 걸로 이렇게 생각이 듭니다. 이 부분은 제가 좀그 우리 곽 박사님이 옛날 법무부 계실 때 예산을 좀 많이 하셨는데 지금은 보면 이 다문화 가정의 숫자가 늘어나는데 불구하고 예산은 줄어들어요. 그래서 이게 이 다음 정권이나 이런 부분에 대해서 이 부분은 좀그 많은 고려가 있어야 될 걸로 생각이 됩니다. 사람 숫자가 늘어나면 또 버짓도 이렇게 늘어나야 되는데 이렇게 그렇게 되지 못한 상황입니다. 그래서 예, 이런 부분이 있고 이제 제일 이 많은 부분이 여성 가족부 그쪽에서 이제 다문화 가정에 이제 그 사업을 많이 하고 그 다음에 이제 학생의 경우는 이제 교육 문제니까 교육부 그 다음에 미니스트리 오브 저스틱 이게 법무부입니다. 이제 법무부에서 하는 예산이 이렇게 있는데 안타깝게도 그 보시면 2014, 15, 16 내년도 예산도 늘어난 것 같지가 않아요. 그래서 이 부분은 예산 문제는 이제 그 고려가 돼야 되겠다라는 생각을 합니다. 그래서 몇 가지 제가 이 정책적인 제안 한국의 경우 제가 토론자지만 한국의 경우 아까 교수님은 오클랜드의 뉴질랜드에 대해서 얘기했으니까 저는 한국에 대해서 얘기하면 사실 우리 정부도 다문화 가정에 대해서 많은 그 노력을 하고 있습니다. 아까 말씀드린 대로 여성가족부, 또 교육부, 법무부 이렇게 노력을 하고 있는데 그렇지만 아직도 이 체계적인 이 정책이 집행이 되지 않는다 이런 얘기를 하고 있습니다. 그래서 몇 가지 좀 말씀을 드리면 이, 에, 이 부분은 잠깐 오, sorry. 그래서 이 부분에서 이제 그 제가 이제 토론자니까 짧게 예 53초 남았는데 <웃음> 제일 큰게 이제 뭐 사업을 하다 보면 사실 예산 문제, 사람 문제 이렇게 되는데 이것보다는 제가 그 연구를 하고 이렇게 하면서 그 작년에 이렇게 설문조사 해봤는데 많은 사람들이 다문화 가정의 그 부모님들이 교육 훈련 아까 뉴질랜드 교육 훈련 같은 게잘된 걸로 이렇게 되는데 우리나라도 73.몇 퍼센트가 다문화 가정 그 식구들이 교육이나 훈련을 받고 싶은데 10% 정도 뿐이 이렇게 충족을 못 시켜준다 이런 얘기가 나옵니다. 그래서 예, 이런 정부가 많은 노력에도 불구하고 체계적인 이 정책 컨트롤 타워 또이 합리적인 정책 집행이 안 된다 이런 얘기를 많이 하고 있거든요. 그래서 이그 다시 한번 강조를 하고 싶은 부분은 예산하고 사람을 사용하는 부분을 체계적이고 합리적으로 이렇게 해야 된다라는 생각이 들고 또이또한 가지 좀 제가 말씀드리고 싶은 것은 이 다문화 가정에 대한 우리 
그 의식의 변화 같은 것이 이제 많은 변화가 있을 거를 변화가 돼야 된다는 쉽게 얘기하면 편견을 버려야 된다라는 생각을 합니다. 그래서 이런 편견을 버리기 위해서는 우리가 뭐 대통령 뭐 산하의 대통합위원회 뭐 이런 조직도 있지만 우리 서로가 마음을 터놓고 서로 그 얼굴이 다르고 좀 생각 문화가 다르게 잘랐다 해서 서로 그 차별하지 않는 이런 에, 마인드를 갖는 이런 부분을 우리 서로가 각자가 노력해야 된다라는 것을 좀 말씀드리고 마지막으로 정부가 많은 돈을 저 지원하고 이 직업 교육 훈련 부분에 대해서 이렇게 하지만 더 많은 돈이 투자가 되고 이렇게 어 했으면 하는 바람이고 저도 연구를 하면서 그런 거는 정책 제안을 열심히 하도록 하겠습니다. 이상입니다. 퀄리티 인트로스팅 포인트 프롬 디스커스 닥터 이남철 사인 데트 리슨스 포 서스펜션 비카스 오브 더 릴레이션십 위스 티처스 앤더 데어 프렌즈 앳 스쿨 앤 올소 앳 홈 아이 싱크 이즈 퀄리티 시그니피컨트 소 스튜어트 레이더 온유 마이드 기브 어스 소머 어드바이스 리가링 티스 오케이 굿 땡큐 포 데트 앤 쉐리 고투 세컨드 discussant, uh, Dr. Kak Jay. And uh, if you look, uh, as you look at this uh, backgrounds, and uh, he's quite an interesting person and a qualified person, because he was the government officials, the uh, Minister of uh, Justice, and so on and so forth there, and a lot of experience too. And uh, uh, he's now as a, uh, working at uh, those uh, uh, Director Migration and Development Research Institute. I think it's, this is a public institute, am I right? And he's got PhD public policy analysis area, the University of Illinois. Uh, please welcome Dr. Kak Jay. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> to enhance the, the diversity of this session, uh, I have to say in English <laughs> and sit here. <laughs> uh, first of all, I have to uh, appreciate a uh, very uh, valuable uh, uh, presentation of Dr. Middleton's uh, to our Korean uh, multicultural uh, policies. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, he said about the, the, the general global trend of migration in the world. Korea now is facing the entry of a multicultural society also. And to challenge, to, for this challenge to overcome to effectively uh, face this kind of global migration, he stressed about the diversity. We have to uh, embrace, we have to, inc we have to accept the diversity of migra migrants in the society. And next, uh, he pointed out the ethnic identity is very important in every detailed project and program. <clears throat> I think this kind of uh, point is very uh, relevant to our Korean uh, multicultural policies these days. But I want to say 
is whether the Korean society, Korean government is embracing the ethnic my diversity of migrants or not. I'm, I would like to focus on the policy equity of multicultural policy in Korean government. You see the, these thick books, very thick, thicker than this, <laughs> quite thicker than this. This book includes the multicultural policy of Korean government to embrace, to accept the diversity of migrants. As Dr. Inamchal uh, presented, we pour, we invest all almost bill, hundred billions of won into this kind of multicultural policies to enhance the diversity of Korean society. We do. We try best, our best, to encompass their diversity in our society. But nowadays, Korean society is facing very dangerous xenophobia, very dangerous hatred toward Korean migrants, migrants in Korea. What is the problem in our society? What I want to say is the most of efforts of Korean governments have intensively poured into the area of international marriage women only in Korea, only in international marriage women. 결혼 이민자에 너무 집중되었다. 이것이 문제입니다. Even though there are very different kinds of categories of foreigners, migrants in Korean society. A serious problem of the migrant migration integration in Korea is that the Ministry of Gender, Equality, and Family dominates the multicultural policy in Korea and the governmental activities and the budget are biased toward the multicultural family who have married to Korean men and settled in Korea. Ironically, one of the most excluded categories of migrants in Korea is ethnic Korean of China who is a group of Korean diaspora, Joseon-jok. As of now, September of 2016, uh, uh, there are about two millions of migrants in Korea. The ethnic Korea of China, the Joseon-jok, is six, 150,000 migrants in here. They compose over than 30% of migrants in Korea, but they are excluded. There are many important law to enhance the diversity of co Korean society. The Multicultural Family Support Act, 다문화가정지원법 of Korea exclude Joseon-jok as 
none of the parents in the family is Korean nationality. Many immigration background young generation of Korean Joseonjo is excluded from the official education, vocational education, many kinds of programs. The other one, the act on the employment, etc. of foreign workers, 고용허가제법, 외국인 근로자의 고용 등에 관한 법률. Also prohibits Chosunjo migrant workers from seeking jobs through private employment service agencies. It's illegal. Most of Korean Chinese are extremely marginalized with regard to HRD and employment provided for the enhancement of multicultural migrants in Korea. Korea now faces a serious social integration problem, mainly caused by the Korean Chinese settlers. Nevertheless, they harshly criticize, they, they means Korean people, they harshly criticize the Joseonjo as they are not showing proper attitude and effort to be included and integrate, in, integrated into the Korean society. They show, the Korean people show, high level of inclusiveness to the international marriage human, but not to the other categories of migrants, especially Joseon Jong. Serious problem. Thus, there exists very keen conflict and discord between the native Korean and the Korean Chinese. Korea never show them to have different ethnic identity. Korean ask them to have the same national and cultural and political identity with themselves. No inclusiveness at all. Considering the increasing inflow of Korean Chinese and their long stay in Korea, we need our Korean society, Korean government need new paradigm, new paradigm of HRD and employment to include many different categories of migrants in Korean society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park Jae, and uh, you provide us quite uh, significant and uh, suggestive uh, uh, critiques with regard to government policy in South Korea. And uh, somehow, it, I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile because uh, we, from now on, before it's too late, we have to pay attention to that. Uh, how we can uh, enhance our government policy but not only the, the problem with this uh, government level policy area, social policy too. Uh, social recognition is quite critical. I'm sure about that. So therefore, uh, I think it's, uh, your point is quite uh, relevant. Okay, and uh, okay, and uh, uh, in front of me there is uh, one clock over there. It's very, it's working hard, and that. Is, they signify that we have uh, uh, 40, no, I'm sorry, that, how many minutes left? 37. 37. 37? No, no, I mean to say, uh, we have to, out of 90 minutes, that means that uh, we have, uh, uh, we have almost more than 50 minutes left. So it's a lot of time, and to that extent, uh, we have to work very hard. That means 
I have to have good questions from the floor. From now only I have two, so in the meanwhile, I mean, say, uh, while I, I am waiting for your good questions from the floor, and let me ask you. Uh, so my questions uh, go to Stuart, at all, not only, also, but also to the two uh, discussants. You know that uh, uh, we, may, uh, we just, uh, uh, Inamchal uh, just mentioned that uh, suspension uh, uh, problems uh, because of the relationship with uh, uh, teachers and uh, friends, uh, that's quite significant. And uh, also, uh, I think there's a problem is that uh, those uh, multicultural families and their members uh, frankly speaking, I don't think we have uh, any uh, phase of uh, measuring or di diagnosing early ages uh, motivation needs. I think it's quite this important, critical one. Not only for enhancement of the employability, but also the uh, schooling too. So I think it is a, a what's the best policy for the a government to facilitate motivational needs assessment to the those target group, particularly when they are young aged, at the age of eight, or before that, and then we have to provide good atmosphere and also educational environment so that they can brush up their motivational needed skills and whatever. I think it's quite this important one. And uh, so my question um, to Stuart is that, is there any good program in New Zealand regarding this one? And then, um, Plus, so what do you think is the most important one to brush up the young children's their motivation needs, needed, uh, assessed need, or found needs before it is too late? And the same question to uh, those two uh, commentators. And so you, you can give us some uh, one point or one other. Thank you. And in the meanwhile, uh, we, we are aiming for the uh, response, and in the meanwhile, uh, still I'm looking forward to your excellent questions from the floor. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, it's what you're talking about is the ugly side of diversity, to be honest. As uh, countries grow more diverse in the uh, profile of their population, then it is an ugly fact that uh, migrant groups will be the ones uh, that are overrepresented in failure statistics in education, in the uh, suspension and stand down style of, uh, of coping with things. Now, that's because we just make a simple assumption in our countries that what we have been doing is the very best there is and that when people who are different come in, we can carry on doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, the simple truth is that a more diverse community makes challenges uh, on an education system. And unless that can develop a wider range of capability and a new set of, um, of uh, skills within the education system, then we will continue uh, to have an increase in those, what I call the ugly side of diversity. Um, I think that uh, we at uh, MIT have been r running our own little revolution, really. We can't wait for the rest of the country. Um, and we are going out and getting students pre predominantly from minority groups at a very young age and getting them out of school and bringing them into a tertiary environment where they finish their schooling and simultaneously uh, get technical post-secondary qualifications. Uh, that is having phenomenal success. And so that tells us that for many minority groups, schools, conventional schools, 
delivered in conventional ways is something of a toxic environment. Yes, there's 31 minutes left now. <laughs> that clock is counting down. Oh, good. Yeah. I have more than that. <laughs> Thank you for that. You think? You think? Yep. Thank you. And uh, please go ahead. <laughs> what are we I ask you, uh, my question was uh, uh, what is your tip for uh, enhancement? Needs-based uh, demands. How we can uh, upgrade our government and the social recognition policy uh, in order uh, for them to be preserved by doing what? So give us one uh, hunch or any kind of uh, uh, tip. That's my question to you. I don't have exact data about uh, yeah. how many there are how many uh, uh, migrants young generation are included in the conventional official system of uh, education or how many percent of them are excluded out of the school I don't have exact but um, and now Korea in has very uh, uh, dangerous disparity uh, toward the, the younger generation, young generation of migrants. Um, I don't know if this is exactly or not. Around uh, below the 30% are included in the conventional educational system. Most of them are excluded from the official conventional education system. What is the problem? I think this, we Korean society have high levels of inclusiveness toward the migrants. I admit them. But there is very some policy dilemma in Korean government. So what I again what I want to ask to Dr. Middleton is: Is there any kind of governmental organization to handle overall migrants of? New Zealand society, or not? Well, there are some specialised government agencies that have responsibilities, for instance, for Māori, for Pacific Islanders and that, but we have not made progress in New Zealand until the mainstream government agencies have seen it as their responsibility, and so that the overall Ministry of Education has seen that it is their job to see that they address the disparate levels of successful outcomes that our system has. So, you know, I think if you're waiting uh, for some kind of um, uh, new organisation to ride in on a white horse and solve it all, you're going to be waiting a long time and at great damage to uh, many, many young people. It, you have to start to say, um, and uh, I'll say this about New Zealand, because you know, I'm a guest in, in another country, that New Zealand had to realise that coping with multiculturalism, if you like, I don't like that word personally, um, coping with that was not an issue that the migrant populations had to solve, it was an issue that the rest of New Zealand had to solve. And in fact, the issue was with uh, the larger group in, of the population, Instead of that, we tend to think somehow migrant groups can pull themselves up by their shoelaces and they'll be fine. Now, at the heart of that is a kind of um, a fairly aggressive view that says when they start being more like us, everything's going to be all right. Well, that's a pretty 
pretty savage kind of attitude towards a group who aren't going to be ever entirely like us. They're going to be different. Okay. And, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, a couple of uh, questions from the floor. So uh, let me do it this way then. And, uh, uh, collecting some, uh, putting some questions together, and I will reorganize in my own way, and then I will give a couple of, couple of questions to each of the three. So number one is that uh, uh, the problems with uh, those uh, multicultural feminist members, their employer as well as employment at small and medium uh, industries in South Korea. And uh, uh, we have some problems. Those problems uh, come from uh, uh, the side of uh, employer side, and also from uh, uh, those uh, government uh, employment agencies. So, those problems, problems come from uh, diverse sources. And uh, also we have some problems because uh, those uh, uh, illegal immigrants still we have in South Korea, particularly in Jeju Island there too. And uh, some, uh, because of the, the uh, drug uh, abusers are still, and uh, they are too lazy, and they are just, uh, uh, breakers, uh, excellent breakers, uh, so on and so forth. So we have a lot of social problems because of that. So uh, the question is, uh, what is the solution? And, uh, uh, and uh, probably I think it's a will give us a good uh, uh, point. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, those two disconnect discussions, you might give us some ideas. So what's the uh, better policy, or better solution way? Tips, please go ahead. Stuart first. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I really don't want to talk about illegal immigrants um, because I, I think that you get into pretty interesting territory if you start carving them off and say, well, we've got to deal with them. There's a humanitarian thing which says, if they're here, they're here, they're here. And, uh, and that we should be working um, to resolve that. I don't, I don't imagine that illegal immigrants are here because they don't want to be here. I don't imagine that they're here because they would have been better to stay where they were. I don't imagine that illegal immigrants come in believing that they have a right to everything as of uh, as of right. Um, I think they probably are leading lives that are full of some tension, lives that are full of some doubt, and lives that even they perceive to be uh, somewhat at risk. So, you know, I think that I tend to say we're dealing with people here, and if we get it right for all of the legal migrant groups, then we shall also get it right for the illegal migrant groups. So I'd just treat it as a as, a, as an issue, that um, th that thing. This is a this is a highly developed country. Um, it uh, it is skilled. It ha it has a commitment to um, thinking through the the programs. I think that I think a notion of cultural diversity is a much more positive notion than the notion of multicultural thing because uh, you know multiculturalism is a is, is a slightly assimilationist kind of view, that one day, one day, we'll all be this great multicultural uh, thing. Well, people can't be multicultural. Uh, people can only be cultural. Uh, people can't have multiple identities. They can have an identity. And I think that really it's uh, uh, bringing a bit more focus uh, uh, to it is, uh, is um, better. I'll use an example. Um, I can speak the Maori language but I never speak the Maori language uh, instead of having a Maori speak the Maori language uh, because, because that w is just a kind of neo-colonial kind of uh, attitude. So, you know, I think that, that this is ra uh, these are all relatively simple issues if we've got a mind to, to sort them and if we've got a mind not to say, but we want to carry on being like we used to be. 
you know, a bit of nostalgia about the old days. Oh, if you want to know my cultural identity, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm Irish of Scottish extraction. Now, that's a bit of a mess, isn't it? <laughs> Prime Minister didn't acknowledge that. Uh, you know, the Deputy Prime, the Prime Minister of Ireland. Okay. Anyway, cultural diversity, not multiculturalism. Okay, thank you. And uh, oh, would you? Oh, uh, well, これ 그 저희가 연구 기관에서나 저나 이렇게 연구를 하면서 느끼는 부분은 다문화 가족들이 그 한국의 그 직장 생활에서 겪는 가장 큰 어려움은 랭귀지 문제인데 언어 문제. 이 언어 언어 문제가 되지 않고서는 이 취업하는 데 상당히 어려움이 있다라는 생각이 들고 아까 자장께서 말씀하셨지만 고용주 측에서 문제. 사실 기업하는 사람들이 자선 단체가 아닙니다. 기업은 영리를 목적으로 하기 때문에 이왕이면 언어도 잘 소통이 되고 또그 직무에 숙련된 사람을 채용해서 일을 하지 언어도 안 되고 이런 분들을 채용을 하라 하는 것은 상당히 어려운 문제입니다. 그래서 우선은 이그 이런 다문화 가족들에 대해서 중점적으로 이그 직업 교육 훈련 시키기 전에 해야 될 부분은 저는 랭귀지 문제라는 생각이 듭니다. 그다음에 이제 이그 다문화 가족의 이제 그 대부분 결혼 이주자 여성분들인데 이분들이 다그 자기 모국에서는 학력이 다 대학 졸업 뭐 이런 분들이 상당히 많습니다. 그래서 자기 나라와 한국의 똑같은 위치에서 일을 한다는 건 상당히 어려운 입장입니다. 예를 들어서 제가 미국에 가서 한국의 뭐 국제 연구 기관에 박사라 해서 제가 미국에 기관의 연구원을 한다는 것도 상당히 어려운 부분이다라는 이런 생각도 있고 그래서 저는 언어 문제를 적극적으로 이렇게 해결할 수 있는 방법을 좀그 해줘야 되고 또 하나는 이분들이 자기가 잘할 수 있는 그 직업을 좀 선택하는 부분 예를 들면 어 중국에서 오신 분은 뭐 중국 통 번역이라든가 이런 부분 또 관광 가이드 이런 부분도 잘할 수 있다는 생각이 듭니다. 그래서 자기가 할수 있는 직업을 잘 골라야 된다라는 생각이 들고 또 자장께서 말씀하신 정부 알선 기관 사실 저 뒤에 우리 한상신 국장님 오신 것 같은데 저 저기 교육부 국장님 계신데 이 고용노동부에서 사실 그 다문화 가정 결혼 이주 여성에 대해서 취업 알선 기관이 상당히 많습니다. 강남에 가셔도 어느 곳에 가서도 이런 취업 알선 기관은 잘돼 있습니다. 그래서 잘돼 있. 있는 상황을 이런 다문화 특히 결혼 이주 여성들이 활용을 좀 못하는 면이 있는 거지 정부에서는 사실 이런 교환이 좀 많다라는 좀 에, 말씀을 드리면서 저의 말을 마치겠습니다. Thank you. And uh, any uh, additional point by Dr. Kwok? What I want to uh, my point is this: I um, in the past. 10 years, during the past 10 years, Korean society poured lots of budget into multicultural uh, policies to enhance the diversity of Korean society. But um, we need the shift of paradigm. The migrants who came to Korea is not coming to learn Korean culture. They came here to make money. Economic motive is very important. But during the past 10 years, Korean multicultural policy, budget, project, most of them 
focused on cultural area only. He said, he asked uh, increase of multicultural budget for vocational training and education for the migrants. He feels different lacks of, of uh, budget to enhance the vocational skills for the migrants. We have a money, but only focused on cultural project and programs only. Not, not all, most of them. So we need reshuffling uh, multicultural policy again. And we need policy, equity, balance to enhance, to increase job skills, how to live, to make them live on, live in the Korean land for better life. That's important. Not make them to learn Korean culture, Korean song, Hallyu. It's not important. So, uh, hopefully, Next government, we need president's election <laughs> next year. So we need this kind of uh, um, management in policy. Uh, balance is very important, I think. Okay, yeah. thank you. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, audiences of coming from diverse backgrounds. Uh, some of you are from government sides here, and also universities, and also R&D area too. And uh, so I think this, uh, uh, this time, this session is quite uh, uh, valuable in a sense that so we can uh, raise some very important issues, uh, particularly those policy-oriented issues, as well as also some uh, real problems-oriented too. So I think it's a... Uh, since we have only uh, for 15 minutes from now on, so I will, <coughs> excuse me, I will learn uh, the remaining time uh, so in a more better way. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> since uh, I have a couple of questions uh, uh, with me, and so I will raise some question points from now on, one by one. So. Each of you will give us uh, some response in your own way. Number one uh, point is that uh, some of you just raised questions about Joseon uh, Jok uh, as a uh, term. So we never say that uh, American uh, from the, the immigrants from the United States or other uh, countries. We just uh, say that those uh, American immigrants or Japanese immigrants or whatever. However, we just, uh, language is just a chosen joke. That created a lot of problems uh, from the perspective of uh, a different points of view. Why chosen joke? So any solution with regard to this issue and uh, you might give us some uh, response later on. This first point, and the second point is a, how we can enhance our uh, good policy or training programs for enhancement, enhancement of teachers and trainers uh, for those target group. We need good teachers in many ways. And uh, 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 Stuart, you might give us some uh, points with regard to this uh, based on your experience. And also uh, the discussions also might give us some uh, tips. Okay. This is a second point. And the uh, third point is that uh, with regard to unification, and uh, is there any government policy uh, for enhancement of those uh, North Korean workforce? 
now were, if not an uh, government, Korean government uh, is ready for that, or any uh, kinds of uh, policy considerations with regard to this issue. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Kak, you might give us some uh, hundred point for if not, and uh, maybe any uh, government officials from the floor side, uh, anybody, you might give us some points uh, if you want. And uh, this is a third point. And um, uh, some just uh, asked uh, Stuart to give us some success story uh, program in your country, in New Zealand, with regard to uh, the issue of uh, how we can enhance, uh, our, how we can educate those uh, uh, immigrants, families, um, members. Uh, and uh, if we have, I'm sure you have, and then you might give us uh, uh, some uh, introduction uh, with regard to. Uh, if you want, then maybe you might give us uh, uh, some uh, email address so that we can get access later on. Next question is, I'm sorry that I have so many questions, and this question is, uh, <clears throat> uh, those uh, immigrant uh, family internal matters. We noticed that certain, uh, many uh, immigrant family members, they have internal uh, conflicts among themselves. Uh, I think it's quite, it's quite serious problems. So to solve this issue, any suggestions you might have were based on your uh, country's experience and, uh, and uh, maybe you might give us some uh, suggestions and also, also this question goes to other two designated discussions too. What else? Oh, I have so many questions I cannot just uh, uh, put together. If I miss it, and uh, sorry about that, but uh, now we have just, just uh, 10 minutes left. So if you <laughs> would with me, if you just, just uh, allow me, and uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, ask each of the three to give us a wonderful response. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> I wish there were as many answers as there are questions. Um, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if there is a program in Korea to recruit migrant members of migrant groups to be teachers. I wonder if there's a, uh, uh, any systematic way of identifying migrants who already are teachers and, and who are living here. Certainly, certainly that would add a lot of value to the education system, not just in terms of the ability of students uh, to relate perhaps to teachers better, but for teachers to relate to migrant groups better. And uh, so, you know, um, that's, uh, that's something that it took uh, New Zealand a long time to come to terms with, um, but now uh, it's, uh, you know, it's quite an, um, an appreciative uh, uh, ch change that's happened, and there's significant numbers of teachers. That also helps to address the language issues. Um, that uh, I think you're absolutely right to identify uh, the uh, language abilities in, in the main language of the country as being quite an issue uh, when migrant groups come in. And simply, you're right, they need to be helped to learn that language. Young people will learn it easily uh, if they can actually speak their first language a little more uh, in schools. Um, because learning first languages is a critical and strengthening the growth in first languages is critical to learning and strengthening a second language. So, um, you know, I think that uh, you can use some some uh, quite quite creative ways there. I, I'm not, I haven't got any comment on reunification. <clears throat> I admit that Josonjok, the term Josonjok is uh, discriminative term in Korea. But in China, the Josonjok is not discriminative, discriminative at all. It's kind of a symbol of pride in, in China. 
as a minority ethnic in China. Big land, very small populations of Chosunjo, but they occupy great territories in northern, eastern area of China. It's kind of a symbol of pride, but it, it is used in, uh, in this very discrimination, not discriminative uh, term in Korea. I always say to Chosunjo, I always say the uh, Korean ethnic of China, they, I call them Chosunjo. I say them, don't be ashamed of to be Chosunjo. You are very prideful generation. You came here to work hard, to work to support Korean industry. Don't be ashamed. But still, Korean society use that term as to devalue the Korean, uh, the, the ethnic, uh, Korean ethnic of China. Mm, I don't know. We need a term change. But what I want to say is we need a term change in multicultural family. People say the Korean society is entering into the multicultural society, multicultural ages, multicultural something. But I don't agree with that. Korean society is not entering multicultural society. Korean society is now entering into migration society. That is important. From the perspective of migrants policy, as we see them as a migrant, not a multicultural family, we can find out what they need to live in Korean society. They need vocational job, vocational skills, they need language, they need job area language something, they need other kind of multiple assistance. So we need kind of term change. And again, as a, regarding to the unification, I also say North Korean work, this, this, this battery, something, they are not just escape from the core, North Korea. In here, as they escaped from North Korea is the, in the past, the past time. Now they are here in living as a migrant. No knowledge about Korean society, no job skills about how to live in Korean societies. We need to support them, not just giving money. That is important. Thank so you. So, need Thank a kind of term change. Multicultural family, not migrant family. That is okay. important. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And uh, any additional points by the Lee nam -chul? Would you? I, 저는 다른 거보다 그 이민자 가족의 내부 갈등 문제 뭐 이민자가 대부분이 이제 결혼 이주 여성인데 뭐 이주자 아닌 우리 저 한국에서 태어나서 자란 또 결혼하고 사는 중년 분들도 다 가정에 갈등이 있습니다. 갈등이 없는 사회는 <웃음> 없습니다. 그런데 이제 가장 큰 문제가 아시는 바와 같이 대부분 결혼 이주 여성의 경우는 그 한국의 그 쉽게 얘기하면 신랑 신랑하고 나이 차이가 최소 10살 많으면 30살 30세 40세 이렇게 차이가 납니다. 그 쉽게 얘기하면 시집 오는 여성은 20살인데 신랑은 50살 이렇게 나이 차이가 정말로 많은 문제가 큽니다. 문화적인 차이보다 제가 그 인터뷰를 하고 이 연구를 해서 그 이민자 가족이 연구를 하고 있는데 가끔 전화가 옵니다. 저한테 심한 욕을 합니다. 왜 욕을 하느냐? 자기 부인이 집에서 열심히 살고 있는데 왜 정부에서 직업 교육 훈련 시켜서 밖에 돌아다니게 하느냐? 
이런 그 얘기를 합니다. 이게 무슨 얘기냐면 이참 여기 공, 공개 석상에서 말하기 어려운, 어려우니까 각자 생각하시고 <웃음> 사실 정부에서는 직업 교육 훈련을 열심히 시키, 시키고 시키려고 하는데 이런 이 우리 한국 사회적인 문제 이런 부분에서 좀큰 문제점이 있는 것이고 요건 갈등 관계 해소 방안을 제가 전문가도 아니고 그 나중에 이런 부분에 대해서 연구도 해야 될 걸로 생각이 들고 또 하나 이 교사 역량 강화 우리 대한민국 저 직업 교육 훈련 또 일반 교육 시키는 우리 교사나 교수님들 세계에서 제일 우수하다고 저는 생각을 합니다. 사실 배우는 사람의 자세가 돼야 된다는 생각이 들어요. 자 우리 한국 사람이 한국에서 태어나서 자라서 성장한 사람이 베트남 말을 어떻게 또 한국말로 같이 캄보디아 말을 중국말을 어떻게 다할수 있습니까? 그래서 이 훈련을 받는 사람, 교육을 받는 사람 마음 자세 이 분들이 한국의 언어를 열심히 배워야죠. 저는 그 생각이 들고 하나 탈북자 문제도 이 저희 그 제가 근무하는 한국직업능력개발원에서 오래전부터 했습니다. 이 북한 주민 뭐 탈북자 뭐 이런 주문을 했는데 이분들도 사실 자기들이 정신 차려야 돼요. <웃음> 왜냐하면 이 오랫동안 30년 40년을 20년 이상을 전혀 다른 사회에서 살다 오면 우리 한국에 오면 열심히 일을 해서 살기 열심히 일해도 살기 어려운데 거기에서 오신 분들은 일하, 열심히 배우고 일을 하려고 하지 않아요. 그래서 저는 우리 같은 동포지만 이분들의 중요한 것은 저는 교육 훈련보다 마음 자세를 바꿔야 된다. 이 자세 자세가 중요하다는 이 얘기를 하면서 좀 마치겠습니다. Thank you. Okay, time is up. Only I have for two seconds, but I cannot summarize the important points. However, if you give me just one minute, then I'd like to summarize some important points. Okay, number one is that. As Stuart mentioned, the importance of uh, uh, the significance of uh, diversity rather than multi, uh, multiculturalism. I think it's, this is uh, quite significant in a sense that uh, uh, we have to have a more open-minded uh, the mindset, particularly those toward those the immigrants. I think it's, this is a very important one. Not only the government policy makers, also uh, socially, I think it's, this is significant. And how we can upgrade our level of uh, open-mindedness toward those target groups, I think it's, this is a very important one. And uh, certainly we have to have uh, think about that and, uh, uh, from the policy point of view, also in socially. I think it's, this is a very important one. Second point is that uh, the internal uh, problems uh, taking place uh, in the community of those uh, immigrants. And uh, I think it is an uh, important point is how we can raise those immigrants' awareness, how we can increase their knowledge, how we can increase their skills. Uh, as uh, uh, as uh, Wak mentioned that, uh, rather than having just a cultural performance-oriented uh, uh, the programs, we have to focus more on skill-related programs before it is too late. And then skill, even skills, as we know that is the, we are now living in the real of consilience. Uh, Everything is inter come together, interconnectivity. So we have to pro uh, build up our programs in a better way so that we can provide uh, those immigrants with those uh, skills enhancements uh, that's more friendly with uh, uh, new era, I mean you say. Consilience euro and everything is uh, just uh, IT, ET, NT, uh, ST, whatever. Yes, and so that we can uh, have them uh, more uh, upgraded. Okay. And uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, finally, I, I mentioned that uh, language itself is a kind of social product. So Dr. Inam Chil mentioned that in mainland China, Joseon Dok is no problem. Where is uh, why problems in South Korea? Because of the socially acceptance is different. I think it's, uh, we have to we can change, we have to change that, right? And uh, we have to have everybody is just open minded toward those uh, ethnic groups. And uh, certainly we have to learn from uh, your country, New Zealand, beautiful. 
Well, uh, thank you for your attention and all the participants from floor uh, just to give us a wonderful uh, attendance. We really appreciate it. And uh, uh, time management concern, I think it's, uh, I'm quite successful, am I? And uh, how, why don't you give you just a big hands toward those speakers and the discussion. Thank you. Have a very nice lunch.